Okay, so today we're having our first um, core lesson, and in today's lesson, we're going to look at uh, FM foundations. So we're looking at basic definitions. And we'll look at some elements of facility management, people, place, process, and technology. Um, we'll take a look at the scope of FM services. What does it cover in the, in the organization? And then we will end up with um, some strategies for FM operations, so for effective FM operations. Um, if you are not currently muted, please mute your mic. Uh, yes, your mic, yeah, so we, we don't have noise coming from your end. Uh, As you come in, please stay muted. So a few definitions. Uh, by the time you work in facility management for a while, you should be able to come up with some kind of personal definition. But there are standard definitions, and there are certain similarities and differences between the different uh, definitions of facility management that we will come across. Um, so I'm gonna take a few of them and then we'll think through them and, uh, and then come up with our own perception, our own definition. I like that particular assignment of what's your own definition of facility management, okay? Um, even though that's not gonna be a submitted assignment, it's an exercise that I would like you to do. Think about this profession, think about all that we're going to talk about in today's lesson and you know, come up with your definition of facility management based on that knowledge. To assist in meeting the objectives of the organization by the cost-effective provision and proactive management of space and services within the law in such a way as to enable the users to operate safely, effectively, and efficiently. Uh, this is a very broad definition of facility management offered by the US Congress. The departmental function or the organizational function that helps the organization to meet its objectives uh, through provision of space and services. So every organization exists in space and that space needs to be served with other utilities, and that's what facility management does. We make sure that the mission has the right kind of spaces it needs, the right kind of services it needs to deliver its services. This has to be done within the law in a way to enable the users to operate safely, effectively, and efficiently. So in essence, or to bring this, the, distill this down, facility management function provides spaces and services and in such a way that that space and services can help people to operate safely, effectively, and efficiently. The Institute of Workplace and Facility Management, IWFM, formerly BIFM, defined facility management as a practice of coordinating the physical workspace with the people and work of an organization, integrating the principles of business administration, architecture, and the behavioral and engineering sciences. Um, there are a few elements to add to our uh, already established understanding from the US Congress definition in this new definition. It presupposes that facility management applies to the workspace, which is more of commercial and office spaces. But you and I know that in our practice, we have to deal with other forms of facilities, religious, residential, and so on and so forth. Now, but the aspect of multiple disciplines and that was silent in the first definition we saw was highlighted in this one, integrating the principles of business administration, architecture, and the behavioral and engineering sciences, okay? So if you were to merge these two together, you would say facility managers provide spaces and services, um, which is used to enable the uh, building users or occupants to operate safely, effectively, and efficiently, right? And how do we do this? Who are the people we bring together to do this? We integrate principles of business administration, 
architecture and the behavioral engineering science, which means we bring multiple disciplines to play in, in providing the services. Now that you know, summary is what uh, the IFMA definition puts forward. FM is a profession that encompasses multiple disciplines. We talked about the engineering sciences, uh, behavioral sciences, uh, and so on, uh, business and the rest. Now, so the FM is a profession that encompasses multiple disciplines to ensure, ensure functionality of the built environment, right? So uh, that provision of spaces and services um, to enable the users to uh, operate safely, efficiently, and effectively is what it's talking about. Functionality is all about efficiency and effectiveness, okay? And then we integrate uh, these elements of people uh, place, process, and technology. Now, uh, in 2017, the whole, all of the um, FM organizations in the world came together to uh, come up with a definition. Uh, this is the ISO 41011 2017 definition of facility management. It defines FM as a additional function which integrates people, place, and process within the built environment with the purpose of improving the quality of life of people and, and the productivity of the core business. So there are two things, there are two reasons why we are employed, why we exist as professionals. That purpose is twofold, improve quality of life, increase productivity of the business. If the organization uh, it's made up of people and the people can be productive, the mission will be successful. That's the whole logic behind that. Okay. FM used to be seen as a technical discipline. Um, so when the guys who build the engineers who build um, complete the building, they usually have some people behind, left behind to maintain, right? So uh, maintenance was synonymous with facility management. So that's why it was seen as a technical discipline. One of the reasons why you still have a lot of men dominating the industry today. I think that's changing very fast, especially for us in Nigeria. But facility management is not a technical discipline. Facility management is a managerial discipline. It's a management discipline. So if you are still at that level where um, you are having to specialize in plumbing repairs and maintenance, air conditioning repairs and maintenance, uh, you are a, you know, IT help desk and the rest, you are a specialist. And as a specialist, you are below the level of facility management as a profession. FM is management, which means we manage people, we manage resources, we use processes and technology and provide the right place and services for users of our facilities. Uh, it used to be mostly reactive. If it doesn't break, we don't fix. So the FM's role before, before now was to wait until something is drawn to its attention and then you quickly then you know, react. The FM's role now is that of a proactive problem solver, solver of problems that have not you know, uh, manifested. So in essence, you are now a proactive operationally, uh, uh, a proactive strategic uh, 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 professional, not reactive operationally focused. A reactive operationally focused is a person who waits for things to break and then goes ahead to, to fix them compared to someone who is um, strategic and proactive putting processes in place, putting technologies in place to ensure that things don't break. So doing things on its own while things are working is what FM is about now. So that every time something goes wrong, no matter how quickly you respond to it or deal with it, you have failed already at the first level. So um, all those stories about how good you are uh, because you are able to deal with an issue expeditiously um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a failure already uh, by the time somebody notices anything not working. So uh, you, you can't sit in and say, oh, well, um, it's, it's not my fault. These things happen. Yes, they do happen, but there are plans and processes that you can put in place 
to ensure that they don't happen in your own um, instance or in your own uh, scenario. You see the building as a dynamic entity, uh, assets on balance sheet, not as liabilities. So for some measurements, uh, instead of just being a uh, we spend money, we spend money kind of mindset. Now, facility management is we provide value, we provide value. So the buildings, the spaces and services provide no longer that of spend money and call it expense, but the value it brings to the organization is what we're now using to estimate and, and uh, understand our work. So in terms of the practical day-to-day -day activities you would engage in in your in your organization, uh, you could be managing cleaning services, could be managing all the support services, front desk, back office, uh, welfare facilities, labor supply. Um, you could be managing maintenance, uh, all of those building components, equipment maintenance, environmental and grounds, energy, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, there are other services like catering with all that goes with it and security services. So instead of um, seeing them as not facility management, they are actually facility management, all right? Because all of these are services provided for the spaces that we manage, right? So, and your job is to provide spaces and services to ensure that the people who use the spaces are productive and they, have, they are safe, okay? Facility management started, you know, for as long as human humanity has existed. Uh, the reason is that uh, there has been one form of consideration for how we live uh, and how we use spaces um, all along. Or, you know, right from the Stone Age uh, where we live in caves to uh, you know modern age where we now build skyscrapers and even. Um, you know, uh, dwellings in space. There are basic human function that require spaces. There are spaces required for living or residences. There are spaces required for work, different vocations. There are spaces required for worship um, of different faiths. Spaces required for recreation and holiday and relaxation, and even spaces required for final resting places. Right. So in all. Facility management is the profession that has just been identified, but the whole thinking, the whole body of knowledge, the whole understanding of uh, the need to provide spaces and the need to maintain and manage those spaces and the need to uh, relate with one another as we share in the use of spaces has always existed through the ages. So by way of uh, history, uh, you know, governments and, and military organizations will typically have a setting works department. So uh, they build and then put some people, you know, leave some behind to, to maintain. And this has, you know, followed through in our modern lives and governments, for example, even at, at educational institutions where you have, um, where you have um, uh, uh, departments of works, ministries of works, you know, they are, they, are, they are supposed to be very distinct organizations. One's job is to build that works and infrastructure or construction, and they are supposed to have the facility management uh, 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 completely different. One builds a uh, hands over to the other. And, and, and that's the evolution we've gone through. Uh, in 1979, the FM Institute, that later became the International Facility Management Association in 1980, uh, came together to say, look, we cannot be seen as maintenance. Maintenance is just one bit of it. We have to have a profession that coordinates this whole element of people, place, technology, and processes to give us place spaces and uh, services that are effective, that are efficient, that are safe and enhance productivity. All right, so that's how IFMA was born. It's one of the uh, first modern FM associations. But the Royal Institution of Estate Surveyors have existed since you know, 1792 um, uh, and, and got their uh, formal charter from the Royal Family of England in 
1868. This, this RICS encompasses all aspects of the built environment. So from the land surveyors to the estate managers in real estate to the uh, all the engineers involved in design and then construction down to facility management, what we call the um, a ACOM, A E C O M, that's the architecture, engineering, construction, operations, and maintenance. Uh, they've always been there and have members. So uh, many uh, facility managers are also certified RICS uh, today. Uh, broadly speaking, you could categorize services that would provide the facility management as either hard or soft services. And if you just take a look at these two lists, you can get a sense of what hard services is talking about and what hot ser hard soft services is talking about. Uh, under hard services, you have building and fabric maintenance, uh, you have energy and water management, you have building man management systems, you have heating, ventilation, air conditioning, HVAC system, you have mechanical maintenance, generators and the rest, electrical maintenance, uh, reactive maintenance, uh, electrical testing, fire alarm maintenance. Uh, just examples, right? So um, just for, for us to get a sense of how FM services can be categorized. In soft services, you have cleaning, caretaking and pottering, grants, maintenance, waste disposal, security, catering, pest control, health and safety services, space management and furniture and equipment. If you look at these two lists, you will find something that is uh, that helps you differentiate them. The hard services mostly is about the buildings, mostly about uh, equipment and um, components built into the building. Uh, your care for these uh, uh, assets uh, is your care for the building itself. It's part of that uh, whole care for the building. But if you look at the uh, soft services, uh, they are they are things we provide to the building, not because of the building, but we provide it because of the users. So uh, the food we bring, the pest control, uh, managing space, health and safety is all about people. So uh, you can call the hard services, uh, building services. That's another name for it. You can call the soft services, people services or occupant services. That's another name for it, the occupant services. So you can get to know, uh, you know how to uh, relate in terms of specifications for new installations, new systems in place, response to people uh, who are probably satisfied and those who are not satisfied with your services. You must know the difference between these two services. What are some critical skills uh, the FM must have to be successful? Uh, the first one um, has to do with interrelationships, um, being able to work with people. Um, working with people does not only refer to the people that are in your team or work in facility management. It also refers to the people that you manage and provide resources for. If you love your team, your team loves you, and you guys work in harmony, and you have a customer who doesn't like you, then of course you have failed in relationship uh, uh, management, right? So that's one of the first skills. Because no matter how well you do your job, if people don't like you or don't like or don't have a, a positive perception about you, you will never ever be rated as successful. And quite honestly, you need the ratings of your users. You cannot say that user is the service and therefore its rating is irrelevant. Every user's rating of your service is relevant. It is actually your final judgment. The other side to this inter um, uh, relationship management has to do with managing people, your contractors, your workers, your, your, your service providers, your, your health uh, the regulatory authorities, whoever you interact with. You may not know, you may not know uh, that your attitude uh, may be creating some impediments to your success, right? So it's important that we build positive, healthy relationships with all those that um, are around us. Facility managers must be very, very effective at procurement and negotiation. Uh, we are not living in a, in a, in a climate where uh, once you hear a prize, you know that that's the prize, no matter how long you search, 
the price will remain the same everywhere, right? Uh, that can only be in capitalist environment or capitalist markets where the information is so widely uh, dispersed and people's access to information sources is so general that if one person decides to uh, go above that, uh, uh, try to make too much uh, profit, for example, the person becomes exposed uh, because of too many um, rivals or competitors who are giving it uh, cheaper but the whole idea of procurement and negotiation for facility managers is you must be able to specify what you want uh, we have a procurement department to say yes but procurement department will only act on a mandate from us for them to act on, act on a mandate from us we must be able to be detailed in our specification so all those one line items to say i need two new acs to replace the ones in the in the, in the meeting room or i need uh, uh you know a, a additional uh, uh, furniture in so so and so uh, space. If you are not able to take your time to spell out dimensions, spell out description items like color, weight, and so on, spell out specification items like capacity, size, and the rest, you may end up uh, receiving something you do not, uh, uh, well, you may not have expected, but of course, since you didn't uh, express in details what you want, then you should have expected anything. That's that's the truth. So procurement is a process of specification. And then when they go out in the market on your behalf, or when you go out in the market yourself, do you just accept whatever price you're given, right? Do you uh, look at other considerations before you part with money? Procurement and negotiation is a big part of FM because when you spend as the second largest spender in the organization after HR cost, which is like salaries basically, um, and you're not spending wisely and intelligently, then you create all kinds of problems for the organization because the profitability equation in business is, is, is a straightforward equation. Uh, revenue, less expenses equals to um, profit, right? Uh, you may not be holding the revenue lever because other people are there trying to bring business into the organization, but you are definitely holding the expense lever, right? So if expenses go down, what happens to profits? It goes up. If expenses go up, what happens to profit? Profit goes down. So that's why you cannot do your negotiation and procurement poorly. Okay. And many of us are doing something over and over, spending money on it and repeating it again because we've not done a thorough job on the negotiation and procurement. In facility management, time is a major currency for us. Um, uh, we can be pulled in many parts, in different parts. Uh, at the same moment, uh, we can have all kinds of challenges to deal with. All of a sudden, uh, we now need to prioritize. We now need to know what to delegate. We now need to know what to handle ourselves. We now need to know how to communicate to ensure that nobody's worrying or panicky while we are trying to resolve issues for them. Okay, you must be able to have a time control uh, system mechanism of your own. So that you don't let things drop, and, and this is very common. You you are you going through the corridor. Somebody makes a complaint. Say yes, I'll fix it in ten minutes. And when I get to the office, you didn't get to the office before you saw your email buzzing with five to ten different emails with different issues. Will you finish the one you promised, the person that you promised, or will you go and deal with the other uh, issues? Uh, there's no right or wrong answer to that. But what happens is that you must be you must have the presence of mind to get back to whatever you were doing before. Um, uh, disruptions came in. So time management is a big aspect of, of assessment. And then you have project management. Uh, the things we do on a routine basis, the step-by-step -step, uh, uh, inspections, uh, fixing things, you know, those ones are all not projects. But every now and then you have to paint a, a, an area, a building, you have to replace a generator, you have to overhaul the uh, swimming pool, you have to change uh, 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 you know, uh, pumps and the rest, you are carrying out a project. And too often, facility managers end up saying, oh, well, we didn't scope it right. We missed out on this particular valve. Now we are coupling it. We now find that that valve is missing. That's poor scoping. Sometimes we have all kinds of creep, and we think it's normal. When you are doing a job, job of 500,000, is gradually ending 800 or 1 million. And you think it's just OK. That's not OK, right? That's not good project management. There must be scheduled in place to 
take into account lead times for each of those deliveries. You can just say, oh, tomorrow we are, we are casting blocks, so we're going to do plastering, right? Um, but have you covered end to end what it takes to do plastering? We have the cement, we have the laborers who are good at it, we have and so on and so forth. Or where are they coming from? So we can get a sense of how to plan uh, a, a, a other activities to go on at the same time we are waiting for the project management takes a lot uh, of skills, but there are skills that we use every now and then in facility management. It's not our core to be doing project management, but we must have the full knowledge of project management so that we can plan the little projects we are handling successfully. Just take something as simple as moving office. You know, you're moving from uh, a rented building to your own building just across where you have now built and a perfecting uh, 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 complex, for example. Do you just go ahead and start picking chairs and, and, and crossing the road to go and drop it? Uh, or do you sit down first to create a communications plan? Do you sit down to create a resource requirement plan? Do you prepare a budget? Do you, and so on. There's so many processes that go into uh, project management that you must learn as a facility manager. Uh, most of the things you have you will come across and you have come across in your career have been encountered before you and they have been solved, right? So research is a key component of asset management. You must be able to Google or search or find answers to problems. You can't just, oh, there's a problem. We have only one solution. The moment you start having one solution, it means you're not researching well. You're not doing well uh, in looking uh, outside the box. Same goes for writing. Um, writing is a way of expressing ourselves. And um, whatever we write, tends to go ahead of us. And someone else is probably reading and making some judgment or interpretation about who we are and how we behave and how who, uh, what we do just by looking at our, our write-up, right? So whether it's a report, whether it's a proposal, whether it's a lesson you are preparing, whether it's a presentation, whether it's a, a speech or whatever, you must know how to write, um, especially when it comes to reports um, uh, I mean, it's, it's so key to most organizations to ensure that the right reports are kept uh, according to standard. And then, of course, you have team working. There's nothing you do in FM that is uh, a, a single man's job. Everything we do is working team, virtually everything. Okay, so uh, team uh, working is the ability uh, of each and every one of us to be able to work in a cohesive uh, bond as a collective. Uh, when delivering assignment. Think about it. Whatever the customer needs, we need two or three inputs into it. And that's where that's where you 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 this particular skill comes in. You cannot say I'm not a, a carpenter, I'm not an, a mechanical engineer and as such, um, I will not work with them, right? You work with them uh, because that's a team that we are forming. Leadership is a key attribute of facility managers. You cannot be a facility manager without being a good leader. If you, if, you, if you have people that work for you uh, and they won't do what you ask them to do, don't, take, don't, don't feel um, satisfied. You're failing in leadership. If you have people that you work for and they're not satisfied with what you do, they're not giving approvals for you to take certain actions, they are not considering you positively, then don't chill, don't relax. You are failing in leadership. You're supposed to have leadership abilities at three levels. Leading those above you, leading those below you, and leading those at your level. So even if you are working as an internal FM and the people you are serving are actually your colleagues in the same organization, many of whom you are higher than in rank, you need to also be able to lead them in such a way that you manage their perception, you provide services for them, and they can give a positive review of your service Right? And the same thing applies to every level, whether contractors, uh, subordinate workers in your, in your team, uh, management, and so on and so forth. You must have leadership skills. And that's, those are some of the things we're going to be looking at in this course. And then you must be able to have an innovative approach. You know, um, if problems come to you all the time and the same problem that you have encountered before, you are encountering it again, at least, at least, you have documented what happened before and how you overcame it, right? And um, part of that documentation should have been something you put in place to ensure it doesn't happen this time. But now that it's happened this time, 
Uh, if you're going to give a solution or solve that problem today, you dare not think about the same solution you used before, because what that means is that you are going to set up this system to make you have the same problem again in the future, right? So, and then uh, there are there are ways we do things that just become obsolete over time. If you are not thinking out of the box, if you are always going back to old solutions to solve problems, you are not innovative at all, all right? And that's why many people didn't realize that things have become so different in the technology space that they still went ahead buying expensive uh, BMS uh, systems when IoT sensors could actually give them a full automation, not just uh, uh, data gathering uh, at a very small fraction of the cost because they're not innovative. They're not studying new technology and looking at new trends. They're just going back to the old school ways of getting things done. Um, just just um, uh, a few days ago, we were having uh, a discussion. Uh, it was actually a church group. And, uh, we all needed to put in some information uh, into a document. And, uh, the idea was to send us the document by email, we we'll populate a section uh, with our information or edit some areas and then send the document back. So you'd have had like 11, 12 documents uh, uh, as 12 versions of the original one and somebody would have had to come in there and start, you know, uh, copy and paste and form the final uh, document for me. Whereas today you can just put that document in a drive, in a shared drive, and everybody just click on it, go to the section where you need to work, do your work inside it, and nobody needs to do any further editing. That document, you know, is, is complete as it is, you know. There are so many things that we, we, we can start adopting in our facility management that it requires us to take on an innovative approach. I've seen cleaning crews that are just increasing in number every year, instead of thinking of more productive ways of Hello, sir. Who was that? It's me, sir. Hello, sir. Sorry to hey, cut you short. Sorry hey, for this. Hey. Uh, in Uluwa, you're me, Emmanuel, sir. Okay. Uh, I didn't understand that. Um, please explain again on the a file you upload that everybody just need to go there and fill. And I didn't understand that part, please. Okay, I would explain it. Uh, but the rule of, it, of this particular class is that you have a pen and paper with you and you write down um, okay. your notes and questions. Yeah? So you allow okay. me run for about 90 minutes and I'll allow 10 to 5 minutes to have answers to all the questions, okay? But I'll okay. maybe uh, answer this one because that happened. Okay, okay. so, 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 so um, I was just giving an example of how you can put a document in a Microsoft SharePoint or in a Google Drive. Your normal Google account has, um, has a Google Drive. If you have a Gmail account, you can just go and sign into Google Drive, uh, put a document in there, uh, make it accessible to whoever you share the link with, and then you drop the link for as many people as possible, and you can all be working inside that document. You know, you can all be working inside there. Uh, we could we could be editing different chapters of a of a book we are writing. We could be uh, uh, we could be uh, 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 filling information into a spreadsheet. Uh, just just this week, if you are a member of the Association of Facility Management Practitioners, you will see that the Director of Communications dropped a membership list in there, uh, and that membership list had all our names and our emails. Suppose emails are missing from there. Um, our payment uh, status for the last three to five years, uh, four years of the association, all the, so, and, and it says, if the information available under your name is not correct, kindly uh, correct it. So 800 of us can go in there at the same time, look at my own line item, see that my name was not spelled well, correct the spelling, see that my email was not the correct email, put the right email, uh, edit my phone number. And then when we are all done, uh, the person who put that uh, document in the, in, the, in the drive can just download um, the document and instead of saying, send me your correction, and then I start doing the correction. You see, the whole manual approach, um, uh, there are ways to get around manual approach for, for everything. Work orders cannot be automated. Uh, visitor management cannot be automated. Health and safety cannot be automated. Even your inspections that you do as facility manager, instead of just going around with paper checklist that now you, 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 you tick, 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 and come back and compile a report. You could actually have that particular form in a drive. 
and then you put in all the information and the information is automatically fed in uh, into that uh, uh, sheet that when you get back you have all the information on instead of coming back to type after writing on paper there's so many ways to simplify our lives using innovative approaches and that's why uh, this particular skill is important for fms to have and then you must have decision making abilities uh, if you make a poor decision it's still better than not making a decision um, what am i saying if you did some analysis and decision making is all about analysis and uh, and coming to a point where you need to act in a particular uh, uh, way, right? Once you have done that, uh, definitely there's been an, a reason why you acted the way you did, right? Uh, if you did not take a decision, uh, then it's worse. People have been in circumstances where they could have taken decisions quickly, acted one way or the other, but didn't, and things became worse. So that's a skill that FM should have. There are certain times you will find yourself in escalating situations, escalating so fast that if you don't know how to act quickly, you may end up with big crises in your hands. And then IT service, I can tie this back to the innovative approach. They are all, you know, in the past, we used to say um, there are IT people and we are FMs, right? Um, IT is just like driving, right? So that era of having a driver who drives and I own the car, we are almost getting out of it now that we now know that we should drive ourselves, right? So we all need to be at that point now where we are all IT um, uh, service providers to ourselves. For example, uh, if I want to uh, uh, deliver on any FM process today, I should be able to do the simple Excel uh, work. I should be able to do the simple codes to automate it. I should be able to do very simple um, uh, uh, uh programs to get it done now but even when you have not reached that level and the organization now adopts a software to help you uh, automate expedite certain activities in your operations uh, are you the one that don't want to invest time in studying how that software should be configured and how it should be used right so those are the kind of things we we talk about fms are supposed to be it savvy just like children of nowadays that can break any code or crack any operational manual without even reading the manual. The FM should be numerical, should be strong in, in numeracy, right? So we spend a lot of money. We have a lot of data thrown at us from our operations, and we need to make management decisions based on numerical analysis, all right? so. The FM must have that. Oh, well, I don't like mathematics and so on and so forth. Uh, we hear that all the time, but there is no there's no profession in life that you can do without mathematics. So uh, I'm not talking about you know complex stuff. For example, uh, for you to know that on Wednesdays um, you need to uh, stay back uh, late. Uh, because certain activities happen in your organization or in your building that re uh, leads to a lot more cars uh, 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 being around in the evening and you need to coordinate that whole process of overflow parking, right? Uh, it's because you have observed the numbers, you'll be keeping numbers of cars in the parking lot, vacancy rate in the parking lot from Monday to Friday or to Saturday, and you know what each hour looks like and you know that you have surplus capacity. But you always have this crisis on Wednesday where you are being called about crisis in the parking lot, right? You'll be keeping tab of that information over time and you now make a decision that you need to do something about this particular timing. Those are numbers, those are analysis you do. Um, you have gener power, uh, generated equipment that generates power and distributes to all your facility. It works all the time, but for some strange reasons, Things blow out uh, at certain points uh, uh, during the day. Uh, maybe uh, around one o'clock is when you usually have issues with uh, overloading of the facility, right? Uh, you must be able to know that there are certain circuits that come on, certain automatic systems that take power that increases demand at that time of the day. Because you are doing your power analysis, which is all numbers. So for facility managers, you must, um, you cannot ignore. Um, uh, the power of numbers. Uh, if you ask the question, if you go to my mentor today to say, um, let, let's pay the contractor in advance, for example, uh, so that the price can be cheap. Uh, my member laugh at you because 
in, in your mind, the price is cheap. Uh, uh, when it brings it down from 1 million to 800,000, if you give me uh, the 800,000 upfront, right? But my mate would rather you give him the 1 million later after we have consumed the, the services he pro provided for with 1 million. Because the 800,000 you are asking for today, for us to give to that contractor, if it's in our hands as a business, what is our own internal rate of returns? What do we do with money? How do we multiply our money? Is it faster you know, in our hands? Can we get more than that 200,000 on top? Uh, the 800,000 we want to give him compared to the 1 million we'll give him later. If you don't know how to do some of those analyses, you will always be recommending something that is stupid and foolish in the eyes of management and they will see you as ignorant and push you aside. You must have emergency reflexes. It means that you must be able to respond to situations as they happen. Not everything you expect will happen. Certain things will have this emergency uh, appeal. But in process management, to be real, uh, to be realistic with you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's no real emergencies because you as an FM is supposed to be proactive to the point where you have anticipated all the things that can go wrong and you have created your plan B, plan C in terms of your risk management plan. And you must have a positive attitude. Positive attitude, never say that, never say never, never give up, always find a solution. There is always a solution to every problem you will ever encounter, not just the ones you have already encountered. And then the competences. Um, in the class for FM careers, we're going to take a look at all of these competencies uh, in greater detail. Uh, these are 11 competencies that came out of an International Facility Management Association Global Job uh, Task Analysis. What they did was to uh, survey all FMs, what they do, the skills they use in, in, in delivering their jobs, I came up with 11 competencies that every FM was acquired. You know, uh, most, uh, most other professions have a limited set of competencies uh, because they are specializations. But facility management is a generalist profession. It's a profession that encompasses multiple disciplines, all right? Because what we provide is not just spaces and services, but ensuring that the people have functional spaces, they are healthy, and they can be productive. So you see that combination, it covers everything about the human existence. So we must have good communication abilities, we must have risk management abilities, we must be able to uh, uh, you know, impact the environment positively and sustainable. We must have a business uh, a commercial acumen, be able to manage finance and procurement. We must be able to manage people, uh, make sure we understand all those human factors from health and safety to temperature, uh, uh, light requirements for the various services to provide. We must be able to lead and develop strategies. We must be able to have operations and maintenance mindset, where we can develop processes, step-by-step -step inspections, uh, out, uh, uh, outlines of checklists, and so on and so forth. And also be able to do installation, all of those technical engineering aspects of facility management comes in here. Be able to manage projects, be able to uh, focus on quality and continuous improvement, focus on the customers and provide results, uh, real estate and property management, Every time you find someone investing in the building, they want to get value from the building, right? You're not supposed to help run that building down. It's it's uh, it's, it's something that you can you can pick up uh, and, and and help uh, on through this uh, whole process of understanding how real estate value valuation, your leases and the terms and agreements that go into those the, those agreements. Um, you know, transactions between landlords and, and yourself if you are the tenant, between yourself and others if you are the landlord and so on. And must be able to have uh, uh, exposition into the latest technology for doing the things you do. Uh, quite honestly, technology changes so quickly that before you finish settling down into the technology you are so excited about, a new one is already out there. Right, so you can't be the one now using an old one. You are deploying an old one already when there's even the latest one out there because every time there's a new iteration of a, of a technology, it's actually better, cheaper, uh, more effective and efficient for use. So the FM must have this core competency.
All right, so um, the key elements of asset man management, the, the first element is people. We are providers of spaces and services, health and well-being, and enablers of productivity of people, right? Because organizations are made up of people. And as such, we are not just managing the people that work with us, uh, on our side of the coin in delivering services. We're also managing the people that we serve. We actually start managing them from their perception and from their expectations so that we set the right um, tone of the expectations and we deliver to meet their requirements. And then of course, the place that we manage, uh, providing the right kind of space with the right kind of services is key to our own uh, success as facility managers. You cannot be providing uh, space for uh, a doctor uh, and, and, the, and the space looks like uh, the way you provide space for a teacher in the classroom. They're not the same. So you as an FM must understand not just the, 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 the need as it were, needs for space, but drill down to the extent of understanding how that space is needed to be used. So, which means if you're providing spaces, you're maintaining and coordinating and managing spaces for a hospital, you must understand how doctors work. You must understand how patients work and how they think and how they behave. That's the only way you can know how to set up the right schedules, the right cleaning process, the right management of, 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 of processes for the teams that you manage. And of course, uh, because you understand the, the place and the people, then you put process in place to uh, provide the services. And then you use technology. Technology is now the, um, uh, how that put it, now the oil that makes things flow. Uh, we cannot keep doing this manually. We have to ensure that once we have the right processes, we automate those processes and they move faster and become cheaper for us to implement. So I'm going to take a five minute break. And then when I come back, I'm going to look at the strategies for uh, effective FM operations. Five minutes break. Okay, welcome back. Can I get a voice confirmation that somebody's in class? Yes, sir, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, sir. Fantastic. I'm here, sir. Okay. Okay, so the first thing to consider in your FM operation is do you have the right team in place? You know, as a manager, if you don't have people, the right type of people, the right number of people to get the job done at any point in time, you are not managing well. There's nothing to manage and you are not effective. You are not producing results. If you have the right kind of people in their right numbers and they are not doing the things that you expect them to do or that the customers expect, you are not achieving results. So think about your workforce in terms of how many are they, but before you even get into how many a day, what kind of work do you want to achieve for your customers? It is that breakdown that you use to analyze how many workers you have, because you know exactly what you need in terms of every skill to deliver what you need to deliver. It is based on that you can develop a gap analysis to say, I think I have too many workers in this area. Let's assume I have too many gardeners compared to cleaners or electricians compared to AC technicians is because I now know the specific job task, the volume of work required to meet the customer requirements. Once I know that, I know I have enough or I don't have enough generally or in various skill level. Uh, the other thing to think about as facility managers is even if I have enough workers today in the right numbers, they are doing the right things, is there any guarantee that I'm going to have them 
like this on an ongoing basis. If you are managing a facilities team, you must be thinking like an entrepreneur, like a business person. A businessman is always thinking about a worker can decide not to come again. How can you arrange your business so that you don't disappoint your customers? Because some workers not coming again might be because they got something really good they need to do and they really didn't care about your customer because they don't have a stake in what you are committed to delivering for your customers and they just walk away. What do you do to ensure that your, you can forecast and your future growth and you can create a flow or a pipeline? Just a few. First, the inventory. What I need versus what I have today versus what I will need in the future. When I have done that analysis, I'm always putting out vacancies. I'm always interviewing. I don't think I've gone through a month for years now, even when I was in paid employment, that I never carried out interviews on a month-to-month -month basis. I don't even need to have a vacancy before I start interviewing. That's what it means to have a forecast and planning towards ensuring that you don't have a gap. I was with a client today and um, um, he says, uh, if, we, if we give you um, your mobilization funds for taking over our, our facilities, uh, how, many, how, how long will it take you to, uh, to mobilize? I laughed and I said, one week, one week. The reason is we have people already waiting to be called up to resume for virtually all the things we will need. And then these people need to be kept in touch with on a month to month basis. Some have picked up jobs, make a note of where they are now working. Some are still available. Uh, make a note of how much they are now earning in case you still need them so you can know how to factor that to your, your budget um, so you can pay them. But of course, you can't get somebody to leave a, 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 a fat pay and come to take your lean pay, right? So you must factor all of those things. You must continue compiling names of, of, of prospects to deploy. I, I see a lot of, oh, I, I need this. Can somebody refer somebody who, who is requiring this? It's fine. But you should be doing that well in advance of the need. Somebody has been on my on my on my tail since morning. I need to employ an FM, I need to employ an FM. I said, don't worry, we, we have the FM, we'll give you an FM. But the person is someone who can resume on May 1st. So I'm having to call people up from my own you know, uh, list as a recruiter and facility manager to provide um, such uh, 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 support of musicians that we work for. So you must think about that and also think about a training program. Your people, you can't assume that they know what they are doing. Even if they prove to you in the interview, when you are employing them, they know what they are doing. Use what you have defined as their job description to create a training plan. That training plan will include things you must insist they go and learn themselves, things you will teach them and they will teach themselves. So things you as a boss will teach, things that they will teach each other as part of cross-training in the team and things you will bring out source facilitators or send them to training for. You have to plan them out and say for this one, just even though we are a, a, a training organization, for one of our sites, I got a, 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 a company to come and train the AC team on diagnosing issues. Um, the guys who are on the shop floor as technicians. Those are the kind of things we're talking about. They, they receive a lot of training in-house. They train themselves. There are things they have been mandated to go and study and come back and show that they know it. And then there are things we train them and there are things we bring people from outside to still come and train them, even though they prove themselves that they know what they were doing when we employed them. You must know your customers. Your customers, the users, the owners, the various stakeholders in your facilities, you must know them. What are their expectations? Some want timely response. Some want proactive approach to problem solving. Some want timely resolution. 
you know, most customers don't want to be disrupted. Please, um, I, I want to do you good now. I want to put off the light so that I can fix something. <laughs> it, it's nice that you want to fix something, but putting off the light, I need to think about it. You know, that kind of thing. So don't, you have to understand what your customers expect. Don't, under, don't over promise, like we say, right? Always under promise. Now, but your under promise, now there's a caveat to this has to be within your service level promise, your service level agreements. You cannot have a signed agreement, which is your official contract with an individual, and then you will not start promising worse than what the contract says. You can't do that, even though we say don't over promise, right? You must promise, you know, just uh, at the level of the contract. Don't have a contract that says you can replace a bulb uh, there's an agreement that will within 24 hours you place a bulb and you come and say, don't worry, I'll fix a bulb for you in less than 20 minutes. Only for you to meet another more urgent task and you came back in two hours time. In your mind, two hours is still fast. After all, it's 24 hours that we have in our SLA. So why would this customer be angry? You have just changed the expectation for the customer. The customer was expecting 24 hours and you told the customer you do it in 20 minutes. Coming to do it in two hours is not comparing two hours to 24 hours, but comparing two hours to 20 minutes. That is woeful failure on your part. That's because you over promise. That's the whole idea of um, not, over, uh, uh, not over promising. Keep your integrity and avoid negative perception in your word and action. Most facility managers, I use the word most with emphasis, have destroyed their integrity. Anytime they submit a quote, too many questions. People are calling to find out prices behind their back before they approve. People are already assuming that there's something in it. Some of the destruction of integrity can come out of promising and failing rampantly, just at random, not fulfilling what you say and, and, and make a jest out of it and make it Expect that people should understand that it's not your fault. Don't they see how busy you are, how big the area you are managing? How can you keep all your promises, my dear? If you can't keep the promises, don't make it. Or better still, make promises, but keep the promises. And you cannot begin to use words like, we are on it. We are almost there. We are working on it. We will soon be with you, and so on and so forth. Be specific in your commitments. Write those commitments down and fulfill them if you don't want to destroy your integrity. Deliver your work on time, respect and care for your customers and all stakeholders. FM is the only profession where you give respect, you don't demand it, but you deserve it and you will get it if you give it because respect is reciprocal. You must be cost effective. You cannot go about spending the highest possible money doing the services you deliver. Customers are now smarter. They know when you are being foolish because it's not your money you are spending. And especially when the, 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 the contract is, is, is uh, take a percentage as management fee on top of the expenses, you become a, 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 someone who spends anyhow uh, because your percentage also goes up. That's a, a, a criminal situation many FM teams find themselves in. You must be professional in your outlook and action. Maintain good housekeeping and have attention to detail in problem solving, identification scoping, and completion. You cannot, you cannot have situations where your, 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 your scope to job, you printed a quote, you'll be given the funds or be approved, and then you start coming back with variations. It just shows incompetence. You must know your facilities and service scope, asset register. If I ask you uh, what kind of borehole you have, you should be ready to tell me it's a 200 feet uh, 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 borehole with uh, uh, a 40 mm uh, uh, PPC riser with a, a four uh, horsepower uh, 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 submersible pump and so on and so forth. You must know, you must know uh, what kind of generator is it? Is it 750 uh, uh, KVA? Uh, what kind of alternator or, or motor it has that's running it? what kind of engine it is, 
you must know you must know your acs you must know the building what 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 kind of construction do you have in your facility and you must also know the services that you are providing if there's a landlord responsibility you must know what services the landlord covers you must know what the contract says health and safety you must have specifications and standards for health and safety specifications and standards for tools and equipment specifications and standards for materials personal quality and work procedures these are things you put in place as the way things are done if i have two ac guys in my site and both of them uh, you know, one service AC on the right, the other one service AC on the left, and I, I received a uh, different outcome. The AC on the right was service and it's leaking water. The one on the left is working fine, right? Uh, but they are both AC technicians, as you say. Did they do the same thing? How can I guarantee that they do the same thing? So that I cannot, I will not end up blaming one person for doing a, a bad job. Is to sit them down and write down the step-by-step -step way to service and AC. Make a copy of it and give to both of them. So when they go to ACA and ACB, they will do the same thing and I will see the same outcome. That's a work procedure. You want to be proactive, disciplined, and orderly. Have a routine inspection schedule. Have a plan, preventive maintenance plan, a planning of how these different maintenance activities will take place uh, across your facility. Have a communication plan that identifies all your stakeholders, what information they need from you, what information you need from them, how that information will be gotten, what are the frequencies for those information, what kind of medium you will use to exchange those information. Documentation. Facility management is generates a lot of data. Uh, you must have uh, if you manage money multiple clients, you must have records for each of their accounts, you must have uh, your asset documents, you must have uh, details about people, you must know who is in which place, you must have assets, uh, a register and other data related to your assets, you must have your HSC documentation, you must have security documents, all kinds of meetings of meetings, operational meetings and the rest, uh, incidents reports when they happen, so you can trace back, you know, root causes uh, in, to prevent them from going bad again in the future. All of these are part of the documentation you must keep. And when there are emergencies, you must be able to communicate the emergencies. You must be able to let all the critical stakeholders be aware that there is an emergency. And when, before there's an emergency, you already have an emergency response uh, uh, program that you know notifies everybody of what to do in case there is an emergency. What about when there's a disruption? Sometimes the disruptions are planned by you. Sometimes the disruptions are uh, sudden, they just happen, right? When there's a disruption, you need to send a notice out before you start attempting to fix. Otherwise, you will rush to try to fix and people will be getting worried. They don't know why there's a disruption. They don't know what you are doing about it. So use this as a guide. Uh, the notice of disruption, what kind of disruption it is, what's the reason, what's the potential impact, who is it going to affect what area, what sector, uh, what are the indicative causes that we can know? If we don't know, we say we don't know yet. Uh, what are the actions we are taking now? If we're trying to diagnose the problem, if we're trying to get an alternative, state it there. What is the estimated time for uh, completion? Estimated time, because you will still need to come uh, indicate in this particular message uh, what's the next time you are going to give them an update before that time is estimated, right? And when it's finally resolved, you must come back to say it's been resolved. Even if they've seen the light has been restored, doesn't mean that you keep quiet. You see the same notification to say, oh, the light has been restored. This is what we did um, to resolve the issue. And this is what we did or are doing to ensure it doesn't happen again. And then your health and safety. I hear people say, I'm a, I'm a HSC officer, I'm a HSC manager, I, I'm not a facility manager. Let me tell you the thing, the truth. The facility manager is responsible for the well being, the safety, the security the productivity of every occupant in this facility. So even if you have one big orga somewhere who is security manager, you have one big orga somewhere who is HSC uh, manager, they are all working for you. And if you really look at how they work, they'll do inspections, they'll write certain reports and they'll send to the FM to go and implement. So you as an FM must be grounded in health and safety. You must know how to develop your own health and safety procedures and processes. You must do your job so, safety conscious that they have less and less of pu punitive uh, measures 
uh, to throw at you. So your job as an analysis, your safety data sheets for chemical use, your daily toolbox meeting where you look at uh, work that needs to be done, uh, what precautions, what quality expectations, what safety hazards uh, to, to look out for, uh, minutes of meetings, you know, uh, fire drills, uh, audits and closeout tracking, PPEs for your staff and security uh, reports. All of this come as part of your HSE responsibility. Your job as a facility manager is to inspect. It's, we call this manage, management by working around MBWA. A facility manager who sits on his desk more than three to four hours in a day has wasted that day. You should be out and about not less than four hours doing inspections and taking notes of what uh, 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 you know, is, is, is happening around you. Because that's the only way you can have a fresh view a vision of what the state of facility is now at any point in time, right? And then you can use that opportunity to pay attention to uh, workers who are working, feel a sense of connection, users of facility, feel a sense of solidarity when you observe their, their pains firsthand and uh, celebrate with uh, those who need to be celebrated because you are noting them, you are present in their, you, you are present around them. Right, and when there are errors occurring in your site, process violations, you can easily pick them up because you are up and about. And then, of course, you provide reporting reports to your bosses and your organization. Also, reports to your customer. It could be through newsletters. It could be through uh, weekly highlights pasted on on notice boards. It could be on you know service guides and all kinds of things that you share with your with your customers. But there must be a two way communication uh, between you and your those who employ you and then between you and your uh, guests or your guests. You must plan, don't start what you do not plan, uh, execute only what you have planned. Planning gives you a view, a total view of how the work should be done, uh, what is necessary, what resources you will need. It is better to spend more time planning than to jump into execution and come back with problems because then you'll be wasting time going back and forth, all right? In the management systems, uh, uh, quality control, quality assurance. Uh, these are areas of facility management where you look at your processes. If they don't exist, you create some new processes. Uh, if they exist, finally, if people are using them correctly, uh, have a feedback mechanism for uh, you know checking to be sure that the checklist you have in place are actually being used on site. For example. And then whenever there are meetings, whenever there are actions from those meetings, they are documented. And then there's a tracking to ensure that the people responsible are able to act on them. Okay, so we're gonna have a discussion now. Uh, let me put up the screen to display everybody in class. All right, you can take a minute or two to review your notes and uh, just raise your hand on the Zoom app to signify your interest in making a comment, having a discussion, a question, or sharing an experience regarding any of the things we have talked about in this lesson. If you notice today, those of you who joined the class at 5.05 or 5.06, the class has started before you joined. So please, the reason we want to maintain five o'clock on the dot um, is so that when we have a, a, a lot of content to cover, we will not be overrunning the 7 p.m. And you will find that happening in some of the courses, the HKC courses, for example, the uh, uh, product management courses, for example, you see them running over seven o'clock. But we don't want it to be a case of um, a facilitator is in class from five, he didn't come in on time, he waited till 5.15, and then um, he now uh, needs to now run over seven o'clock because of that, right? Because whoever comes in at five should have the advantage of being there by five. That's why we started at five on the dots today. So you would have missed some part of the lessons if you came in one minute the, uh, after five o'clock. We want to make, a, make that a uh, permanent tradition. So please come into the class uh, before five. Don't see five o'clock as a time you should log in. At least five minutes to five, 
10 minutes to five is a good time to log in, okay? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> Abir's hand is up. Let's hear from you. Okay, good evening, sir. Good evening. Sorry, Daisy. Yes, I was checking my soft copy, the one you sent through the mail to this lecture. Um, when you were discussing, I don't, I, I didn't remember the topic where you talk about the procurement, time management, project management, and um, teamwork, and that is not is missing in the soft copy you sent. Is it? Okay. Okay. It's, missing. it's not there. Okay. That's the skills, right? Yes, the skill, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So exactly. what I'll do is what I'll do is yeah. which other one? What I'll just do is I'll I will share this one that I've edited with uh with uh, the training manager to share with you all again. So you have the two versions. Okay. There, there will probably be a couple of slides in that that are not here, and a couple of slides that are in this that are not there. So you have both, okay? Okay, okay, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. To emphasize uh, the need to uh, study the material. Up. Pardon? Hello, Mr. Paul. This is my hand up. Is it oh, okay. Showing? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, please. I wanted to um, verify something between is there any distinction between the both of them. Come again. I mean, is there any distinction between property manager and the facility manager? Okay, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um. Yes, there's a very big distinction, big one. A property manager primarily, primarily functions to ensure that the property retains its value, that the owner gets his return on investment for investing in the property. A property manager is a commercial person. It's usually an accountant or a lawyer who is there to manage the investment of the owner of a property, right? And his job is focused on rents, collection, is focused on statutory compliance, is focused on valuation, and then is focused on physical asset quality. And that's where he meets the facility manager. So when the facility manager is on, on, on board, the facility manager ensures that the assets Physical quality is enhanced through maintenance, ensures that the users who have paid rent and service charge get value for their services. So in essence, if you were to take the property manager and the facility manager, the property manager is owner focused, facility manager is user focused, okay? We ensure that the users are healthy, are productive, are having full value for their services. And we use that to support the property manager's um, strategy as well of ensuring that the place is occupied. For example, if there is vacancy in a space, right, um, it may be because the facility manager is not providing good services. People are packing out, right? So if you are doing good facility management, people are happy to be there. That will make them to stay and pay their rent more. So both property manager and facility manager must work together hand in hand. Um, to provide uh, a service, but in all, the property manager is the one that is like the account manager of the owner, okay? And it is because the property manager is doing his right. job well, the facility manager has the money with which he can provide services. Okay, so one thing, and if, if a facility manager, uh, you know, grow to be a property manager, Exactly. So, exactly. So, so yeah, anything like that. Yes, it's possible. So, so a facility manager okay. can be. So, if you want to become a property manager, you will have to do some uh, 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 studies in real estate, estate management, okay. um, all of those valuation uh, uh, training, all of those uh, uh, lease and transaction management, all those legal aspects of uh, put together agreements and the rest. 
you will learn those ones that you can now uh, become a property manager. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Bumi? Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um, on the question that was asked last, yes. um, I find myself doing a lot of things, even though I've not gone to school, you know, to learn them. Over the years, I've invested in properties, I've managed properties for people. If I share office with lawyers, so I know quite a number of things, and I felt okay, I can do more, and that's why I'm here. So is it possible to be both a property manager and a facility manager? That's the common situation we find ourselves, actually. You know, okay. if you are managing an estate, a residential estate today, you are both a property manager and a facility manager because you are chasing for uh, uh, estate dues and service charge uh, collection. You are the same person creating the budget, right? Um, in some of those estates, you are still the one representing the landlord in collecting his rent from various landlords. And as well, you will not get down to the services, you will not write service level agreements, you will not have vendor agreements with uh, uh, vendor service providers, you will not be supervising their work, uh, doing the water tests, doing sewage checks, doing the electrical inspections, and having checklists. So most of us in our industry today are a combination of property management and facility management, right? Um, so, so it's when you now have large organizations like some of these high-rise commercial uh, 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 properties like uh, uh, malls, um, you know, you don't start seeing that dysfunction because the work will be too much for, for one person to handle. You now say, okay, let's break it down. Let property manager handle transactions. Let the FM take care of the buildings and the people. It's okay. Thank you, sir. Then another, you mentioned that a facility manager needs to be grounded in HSC. Yes. Yeah. What we're going to cover in this course, will it be okay or one we still need to attend another or a higher HSC course? Because I have um, battled with all these things for years and I just wanted to manage my resources. So I didn't want to be just going up and down here and there. So we won't still need to attend another special HSC course to be compliant okay. or the one for this course will be okay. In fact, what you're going to cover in this course will be enough to get you HSC competent for our, our, our facility management, right? For example, you will learn about permit to work, you learn about work, uh, 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 work method statements, you will learn about uh, 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 all of those uh, checklists and they we even have a project on HSC audits, being able to audit your facilities and come up with mitigation uh, 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 solutions uh, to overcome HSC issues, right? Now, so, but beyond what you would have learned, when you now have specific situations on site, take this week, for example, um, I have a staff who's managing uh, one site um, and because of the high cost of buying um, uh, cleaning chemicals and all that, she went to learn um, how to make uh, liquid soaps and how to make some of these um, chemicals for cleaning, right? And then she came and, oh, well, I've learned this, I've learned this, I even have a sample and so on and so forth. So I now sat her down and said, okay, it's very good. You can save costs, right? But you know that the safety data sheets of what we used to buy in the market, we rely on those manufacturers to give it to us. Now you're a manufacturer, you have to know how to create your own safety data sheet. So go online, look at all the key ingredients you have combined together to form this your soap, and then download the various safety data sheet and combine to create your own safety data sheet. Now that's a reset she has to do and complete that SDS before we can now say, okay, fine, these soaps and these uh, other chemicals are safe to use because we now know what's in them and we now know how to use them. So you, you see that that's not something we can cover in this, in this class, right? But the knowledge that you need SDS for every chemical you use is covered, isn't it? So the that's particular true. details of what the SDS should contain, you cannot go and research or learn more um, as on a case by case basis as you use them. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. 
All right, Joshua. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Uh, listen. Good afternoon. Yes. Sir. Good afternoon, Joshua. Go ahead. Okay. So, sorry, sir. This is um. <clears throat> I want to ask a question concerning what you said. I don't know if it will fit into, is it under safety, but is it for, if, if, as a result of what you said now concerning for an MSDS. And <clears throat> some I on liquid soap and some cleaning reagents. Some organizations, is it proper to have to submit MSDS for cleaning soap as, as, as I won't say small? Liquid soap, normal liquid soap for cleaning. Is it is it uh, necessary to submit MSDS for them? Because most every everything you use, everything, air freshener, soap, glue, when technicians are gluing things together, uh, uh, bleach, uh, disinfectant, uh, anything, oils. Even your diesel is supposed to have an SDS if they are following strictly what the standard should be. Wow. Okay. Sure. Because you know, you know that if something like diesel pour on certain surfaces, it dissolves the surfaces, it becomes slippery. Many people don't realize that, right? So if you don't have the SDS, you don't know how to treat such a situation when it happens on your site. As simple as that, we use diesel all the time. Some people take out oil from their generator and they just empty it into the drainage, for example, pour it into the septic. It is wrong because that is a, a, a contains chemical that you need to understand. And then that applies to everything, even paint. You know, sometimes we buy paint and then you just go into the house and then you paint everywhere and people are inside the space and some are having some issues. They don't know what they are dealing with. You must have the SDS of that paint before you start applying it to your space. You, you know, in practice, it is rare to see people complying 100%. So if you're in an environment where they are demanding it, see it as an opportunity to learn and, 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 and be perfect. Because if they don't demand it, because the customers don't know, many of us just ignore it and they will just move on, bring the paint, paint, move on, carry glue, come glue, bring this and use and move on, you understand? When they start asking, I say, ah, is it not just, uh, is it not just uh, oil? Why am I going to get SDS? It's not just soap, like you are even, even surprised when asking for SDS for soap. That soap can kill somebody, I hope you know. <laughs> ah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Juliana. Okay, so my, um, I want to ask if uh, you're going to uh, take us to risk assessment. In the I think you get my question, 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 sir. Come again with the question. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, you are talking, talking about... Um, HSE, but you didn't mention the um, the other one, risk assessment. So I wanted to know if it's part of the things you are going to take us through. Yes, yes, yes. Risk yes, assessment. Definitely. Okay. Yes, you know, you know, you know. I I talked about job safety analysis or job hazard analysis are one of the line items. There's any time you are doing a job hazard analysis, you are doing a risk assessment because you are identifying all the hazards okay. and you are identifying the risk of each of them. I are putting measures in place to prevent them from right. manifesting. Yes. We have, we have a project Thank now you. where they are going to uh, bring tanks from the roof and put tanks uh, up on the, on the roof, right? New, new tanks. Anything can happen in that kind mm -hmm. of uh, project, right? So we have to be very meticulous in looking through what the team has come up with as the risk or the various likely hazard. They must first state how the work will be done, uh, the rope, the ladder, the pulleys, uh, the, the, all the tools and equipment that's going to be used, we'll state all of those and show they are on ground. And then step one, we will do this. What are the hazards? Step two, we'll do this. What are the hazards? Step three, we'll do this. I need to review. I just did that for a project that we're going to uh, have. I don't, I'm the one reviewing, right? Since I have taught them that they must do a job safety analysis before the job can be done, give them a template to do it. My own is to ensure that they that are doing the job, are able to identify the likely risk, okay? Because if they cannot, they will be caught napping. And because I understand what the work they are going to do, I can know when they have missed out on certain risk. 
in that uh, particular uh, job. There was a time we had a, 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 a roof replacement where you have to take out uh, certain roofing sheets and replace uh, the sheets. And there was this high tension cable not far away from, from the plate. They had a very good uh, uh, job safety analysis. It was done well. Two people were working together. One is down. When one removes it, you send to the one downstairs, and so on and so forth. But the manager who was supposed to supervise that job and ensure that they follow what has been agreed, um, let them to do the job and went to church. And this guy says, let's be quick. You start from here. Let me start from here. So they were both losing at the same time. Instead of doing one and bringing down, small wind came and aluminum roof fell, pushed the roofing sheet against 11 kVA uh, high tension line. And the guy was roasted immediately. So you, 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 you can imagine how dangerous our work can be. He dropped, boom, and they carried him to the hospital. So just keeping my life cost almost half a million immediately. So sometimes when we teach, it looks as if uh, this, is, this is theoretical. It's not theoretical. In practice, we meet the reality of what we... And if these guys had, after agreeing that they would work that way, stuck to that plan, that accident would not have happened. I'm talking about something very extreme, but it goes all the way to um, people who are using a, a hammer and nails. Instead of using a drill to drill, they put hammer and nail, and then they don't protect themselves well, and then they knock their own, own hand. The next day, you see them in bandage in that hand. You know, so a lot of things, you know, can happen from very big to very small. Our job is to ensure that we have processes in place to prevent them from. So it's, it's better to take enough time considering the risk and putting plans in place than to allow the work progress in a hurry and then come back to face the music. For example, that roofing job I was talking about, it was delayed by a whole month after that accident. And it looked almost as if, if it was not done that weekend, the world was going to end. The world did not end. One month later, before the job was eventually done, because I have to deal with the life first before we came back to roof. Nobody talked about the roof for the whole month. You know, so that's how work mm -hmm. is, okay? Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good evening. You know, we are starting very, this is the first class, so we usually start very jelly, je je yeah? It will be very sweet before we start getting into some of the more complex uh, things, yeah? Our mind will be relaxed, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> so just read through what we have, what we have, uh, we have discussed, yeah? Read through and then think through it and then research more. You just keep, keep learning, okay? Um, by the time we get to the fifth, sixth class, we'll start bringing some other more complex things. But by then, you'll have to be more relaxed. You see, there's no assignment on this one. No assignment, no assessments. Yeah? Easy, right? <laughs> well done, guys. Have a good evening. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yes. Hello. On that one, let me just give a word of caution and advice as an old guy. Uh -huh. It is not for new. So please, I'm talking from Sierra Leone, but trust me, it is very correct. Let us don't take it funny at all. At all, the class is rich, but when we get to reach the benefits are mega. I'm telling you, the new people, please, let us see as very serious as it is. It, it was Anyway, thanks, Paul. Thanks for the team. I'm Thank on focus. You. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very Fatima. Much. It's good to have yeah. you here. Thank you so much. Fatima from Thank Sierra Leone. You. All right. Thanks That's a lot. Nice. Have a nice evening, everybody. Bye bye. You too. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.